It's a real pleasure being here. And um, what I want to do is not give you the normal science talk, which I, I normally do. I usually come in and spill out the, uh, the last um, 20 stories of unpublished data, which is always what's so fun to do. But I'm going to do something different, because I'm getting old. Um, and I've, I'm going to be training my 65th PhD student uh, this fall. And I thought I, I might want to do a type of talk which I think is going to be the type of talk that I wish I heard when I was in your stage in my career. Because these are the sorts of things that never really get articulated um, as to what's important um, for you know, this process of, of being a scientist. Um, and so I'm going to reflect a little bit on a journey that um, started from this picture. I was a 20-year-old. Um, uh, I was an auto mechanic and a lawyer. And this is, I was on my way to my first job as a tree climber for the Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest counting insects in the tops of the canopy. Some people know this forest. Um, um, and talk a little bit about the things I've learned on the way. And so it's really a talk. It's a little bit of a, a sermon, I think, is the right word for it. Um, like looking for a priest collar to provide the right sort of Nita hem and organ to provide a little bit of acoustic uh, emphasis on some points. Um, but it's, it's a sermon for young PhDs, but it also, but more importantly, for young group leaders who are, you know, one of the biggest and most important things your job as a scientist is training other scientists and, and to have some empathy with what they're going through. So let, let me give you a little spiel on this. I, some of this is on uh, my home page uh, called The Scientist Creed, if you want to read about it. And I want to reflect a little bit about the weirdness of being a scientist. And a scientist is a strange profession because it's a profession without borders. Um, and it is a profession where we all have the same currency. And that's what makes us so different from being a doctor or a lawyer where your degree is pretty much constrained by the nationality or the country where you were trained in. You know, a, a science paper is good all, all over the world. Um, there isn't a country in the world that doesn't care about science. Um, even North Korea cares about science, as long, as long as that helps the missile get to, you know, where it wants to get and helps the president uh, get some respect, which I guess is what he's trying to do with his, his nuclear program. Um, so that common currency means that um, we're in a profession that basically makes us vagabonds in some way, because we usually are all oriented trying to go to the best scientific opportunities. And if that means Saudi Arabia, OK, we go. We think about it anyway. Um, and uh, very frequently, the countries that train us are not the countries that have the scientific opportunities, uh, the best scientific opportunities. So it's, it's one which we frequently requires you to uproot yourself and go to a different cultural context. Now, that's OK. Science is, is um, so it has this common currency, um, but it's always practice it in a particular cultural context. And that generates some of the constraints, because that means that some of the things that were worked for you in your particular cultural context are not things that are going to work particularly well in the culture that you happen to be trying to practice your science. And for me, coming as from the US um, uh, to the former East Germany to set up a Max Planck Institute, one of my biggest challenges was just to learn how to do top-rate science in a culture which was so vacation-oriented um, <laughs> as Germany is, and, and not really allow you to be proud of your profession, to be a nerd, to talk about your work. Because they had this wonderful word called a Fachidiot, which is somebody who talks only about their profession, and nobody wants to be a fach idiot. Um, um, so anyway, we have this common currency. Uh, it's our discoveries, and it's their impact. Um, now, I, I, being a scientist is a privilege. And here's the real sermon part. Um, you know, other people have real jobs. And I have to pinch myself all the time to realize that I get paid to do this, you know, to have fun. We're basically paid artists. And, and because this process of, of structured knowledge acquisition is such an artistic and such a personal thing, you know, we have to recognize that you know, there really aren't other professions of paid artists the way that we are. So that means that because it's a privilege, we have certain obligations. And we have basically two main obligations. As I see it, we have these obligations to A, take our job seriously. And what I mean by that, um, it will become clear in a moment. Um, and we also have the obligation to communicate our scientific discoveries. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that too. So let's talk about taking the job seriously. Taking the job seriously basically means uh, becoming a knowledge addict. To make 
this business of scientific inquiry and addiction. Now, I am sure, having raised three children, that being a knowledge addict is the default state of the human mind. And anybody who has a kid knows perfectly well that kids are just little machines to, act, to acquire information. And uh, we are, have brains in neurobiology that's actually probably designed to, to harvest natural history information so that we can learn about the world. Right now, it's sort of, it gets diverted to dinosaurs or trucks or motorcycles or whatever else, you know, if you have a little boy. Uh, um, that's what they fill up their brains with. But anyway, this business of being a knowledge addict, which is, you know, you know, amplified by the dopamine circuit and just like sex and fatty foods and all these other good things, you know, is something that is, can be an addiction. And, and you get rewarded by all these pleasurable circumstances. But unfortunately, it's an addiction that become, can become unlearned. Um, for lots of reasons as you age. And the point that I want to make about this addiction is really one that's um, a little difficult to describe, so I'll try to tell a joke. Um, I'm not very good at joke telling, and this is not a particularly politically correct joke, so excuse me if you have, but you've heard it before, I'm sure. It has to do with three heterosexual women talking about the advantages and disadvantages of having extra extracurricular affairs. So we have um, the lawyer uh, on your, uh, over there, um, who uh, argues that um, having extracurricular affairs is not really, um, is actually a fine idea because most marriages end up breaking up. The, the divorce rate is about 50% uh, in lots of countries. And those legal complications, of course, just make it make it more difficult. So uh, have boyfriends, don't have husbands. The doctor, as you might imagine, argues um, that uh, having extracurricular affairs is probably not a good idea because there's all these dangerous sexually transmitted diseases and um, uh, having a husband helps you be monogamous and um, legally sanctifying it um, uh, will reduce your disease risk. Now the scientist, uh, she's been listening to these two women talk and she uh, says, uh, you both have it wrong. You both have it wrong. You have to have both husbands and boyfriends because then you can go to the husband and say, hubby, I got to spend a little time with a boyfriend. And then you can go to the boyfriend and say, boyfriend, I got to spend a little time with a hubby. And then you can go do an experiment. Now, <laughs> the point is, the point is, because science is a passionate activity, it has to be incorporated into your relationship and your partners have to understand this passion. And if they're not part of it, it can frequently become a divisive thing in your relationships. And so incorporating that process of, of sharing the passion, not only with your partner, um, having your partner understand it, but also sharing it with your children um, and having them be incorporated in the scientific discovery process makes things work for the long run. You all end up pulling on the rope in the same direction um, and it doesn't become a divisive thing. Okay, so that was the one point about this passionate process, this passionate engagement, passionate engagement that science requires. And when you think about all the different stages that human beings go through, you know, humans develop and go through all these amazing stages as they become, as they become a grown-up, but I would argue that the last stages, as you get your PhD, are frequently as transformative as the stages prior. And these, this transformation basically requires that you have to learn five things. I'm gonna go through those five things to, to really become a, a scientist, and it requires this sort of engagement. So when you look for students, you wanna be sure that you're dealing with people who are sharing your same passion for science and its discovery, whose hairs on the backs of their neck go up every time they got some exciting thing that they've discovered. If they're not, they have unlearned that passionate process, don't waste your time with them, okay? It's only gonna be frustration um, as you figure out a way to work together and, and do good science. And this, this business is what I call scientific grit. And I'll try to, grit is a, is a psychologist term that um, describes the sorts of a, a behaviors that are required to attain a particular goal, a particular endpoint. It's not the breakfast food that people eat in the southern eastern United States. Um, Although eating grits might help you develop scientific grit, scientific grit is really the way that you organize your life um, to be a scientist. And, and I'll kick this term around a little bit more. So anyway, I told you there, there are basically five things that I think are essential to become a successful scientist. Uh, um, there is critical thinking, critical reading, crit organizational skills, scientific writing, and scientific presentation skills. Now, 
before, I think, are basically not taught very well in most PhD programs. The fifth is taught beautifully, beautifully so I'm not going to talk about that. Every, every PhD program I know has a soft skills course on how to do, do a good presentation, and it's almost pretty formulaic, and everybody gets it. But the top four are not talked about very well, and they're frequently just sort of passed on from the way that you learned it, and it should be good enough for the way that your students are learning it. So I want to talk a little bit about them. And the first one is the most important one, because that is the one skill that does not have a shelf life, will not age. If you get this down right, you will be a scientist for the rest of your life. And that process of critical thinking, which basically boils, boils down to formulating testable hypotheses and particularly alternative hypotheses, um, is one of those things that you have to practice all the time. We have whiteboards. This is what our lab meetings in my department are all about. Come, looking at other people's testable hypotheses for a particular work. Now, the key thing about a testable hypothesis um, is that the hypotheses, the alternative hypotheses, must be posed at the same level of analysis. And since I was a PhD student, actually in a, not in a plant biology department, but in a, the section of neurobiology and behavior at Cornell, um, I had the fortunate to have uh, Paul Sherman as, a, as an advisor. And Paul um, has written this wonderful book that sort of analyzes where the big scientific debates come from. And uh, this is the, the references down there at the below. Um, uh, and Paul argues in this, uh, in this short paper that some of the most um, publicized scientific debates are really scientists who are talking past each other because they're talking about hypotheses not posed at the same level of analysis, but at different levels of analysis. So there's a beautiful example from Stephen Jay Gould and John Alcock, Alcock who were arguing about an important topic that you might be interested in, like the evolution of the human clitoris. Um, uh, and they were just basically talking past each other. So one of the things that you have to practice when you're developing the skill of, alternative, of testing a testable alternative hypothesis is to make sure that your hypothesis is formulated either in the how, uh, the mechanistic level, or in the why, the evolutionary functional level. And those are broken down into development and, and molecular mechanisms, as you can see here on, on that part. This is really going back to Beverly's talk yesterday, where she described beautifully the, that beautiful mixture of looking both at mechanism and at function and at evolution. Um, and one has to be really careful that your alternative hypotheses are at these different levels of analysis. Now, one of the things I like about The New Phytologist is that it publishes lots of papers that are right in that interface between mechanism and function. And I, and I like that because there is this beautiful interplay between mechanism and function, because mechanism gives you the details, the tools that allow you to, call, to conduct manipulations that are so useful for testing functional hypotheses. Because without manipulations, you can't parse causality from correlation. And that's the problem with most ecologists. They don't have the tools to be able to manipulate the things that they are trying to figure out what they're doing for an organism's Darwinian fitness. And by understanding enough mechanism, you have those tools if you can knock them out or express them differently or do differently to be able to understand what is a particular trait doing for an organism's Darwinian fitness or why did it evolve? So one of the things when I set up the institute in Jena um, 20 years ago um, is that I wanted to set up a training environment which allowed these three disciplines to be mashed up, uh, to take ecology and basically natural history discovery um, and chemistry and molecular biology and Muse, do a mashup on them so that young scientists could be able to use all of the skills that are entailed there and basically ask functional level questions. The same sorts of questions that Charles Darwin was asking, Alexander von Humboldt was asking, but these students have a mass spectrometer in one pocket and a microwave in the other pocket and hopefully a genome behind them and, um, and I like to call them a genome-enabled field biologist. But this is what I think you know, is, is really the future of what uh, plant biology can look forward to is that we have the ability to really be going back to those fundamental functional questions now. So let me go back to those, those five essential skills. I um, talked a little bit about critical thinking. Um, there's also this business about knowing what has been published. Uh, in developing critical reading habits. And this is another one of those things that I'm always surprised. It only comes in secondarily in journal clubs. Um, my major advisor, Tom Eisner, used to say in his most sarcastic way that a month in the laboratory, Ian, will save you an hour in the library. 
um, and one really needs to uh, figure out what has been published. And there are very few firsts in science. Almost everything else particularly has been discovered by the Germans at least the century before, if you could only read the German. Um, and this is why so many journals really do not want you to say, this is the first discovery of this, because usually it's wrong. There's some, you know, somebody else has actually published it before. Um, so reading the literature is so important. Reading it critically, do not believe just because it's published in science and makes this claim that it actually does make that claim. And that's knowing that and reading that critically helps you design experiments that will become immediately interesting because you have found an erogenous zone in the literature, a sweet spot that you can target your scientific questions to. Yeah. And of course, the landscape in publication, scientific publications is changing dramatically. And what was good for, your, for you or for your mentors is not going to be good for your students just because the world is different. I mean, most of your students are probably reading all their literature on their iPhone, right? The PDF is going to be a, a, a has-been because you can't really read a scientific paper on, uh, in a PDF format on your iPhone. And there are many other formats like Lens that uh, eLife has, has developed, and there's a new offline version of Lens, which was just released uh, last week, you should maybe take a look at, which is much more iPhone uh, 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 friendly. Um, but anyway, reading is so important because reading is also so important for developing critical and excellent scientific writing skills. Um, that's the next one on the list. And uh, the more you read, the better you write. I'm not going to cover the writing skills stuff because I've already got an iBiology talk on that, um, on some of the mechanisms. But I'm going to make a, that's what the iBiology talk is. They give you these weird slides to, to advertise their, their, their talks. Um, but I want to talk about some two general things about publications, which I think were developed a little bit in some of your discussions and workshops earlier, which I unfortunately missed. Thank you, Ryan Ayer. Um, and, uh, um, and the first thing was just your obligation about publishing your discoveries because it's not only, in, uh, it's the way you timestamp a, uh, uh, a discovery, right? It, that's the whole reason for publishing it, to, to allow other people to stand on your shoulders and to get a timestamp on it. Um, I suspect that uh, uh, bioarchives is probably going to be the wave of the future that we all publish in um, once we sort of get ourselves into a, a mode that is, um, a little bit more of an open peer review system that I think will be a lot more fair. This is a lot of what uh, eLife is all about. Um, but then, of course, as I mentioned earlier, the, your obligation is to uh, communicate your discoveries to a lay audience. Uh, the lay audience is going to be more and more important uh, in your ability to fund your research. Uh, crowdsourcing of research, of course, has become uh, a hot topic. They're not going to, you're not going to be successful in doing crowdsourcing unless you have uh, communicated with the, with the multitude of science writers who are always looking for material and developing a relationship with them to be able to, to get some um, uh, press traction on your on your discoveries is really an important part of, of being a scientist these days. Um, I want to talk a little bit about a disturbing trend in publications, particularly for young scientists and for young group leaders. Um, and that is that um, very frequently, uh, PhD students who are trained by young groupers, group leaders do not get what I think is a right to write a paper from scratch from start to finish by themselves, a single authored or, sing or first authored paper. Very frequently there are, because the standards for journals um, is increasing all the time and you have to have more and more stuff in order to make a decent paper, and there's 20 PhDs on there and ev everyone contributed some part of it and at the end of their degree, they just got a little piece. Uh, and it's been hard for them to be able to say what actually was their role in that monster paper that's there. And again, eLife is developing some tools, uh, a tool called Hypothesis, which will be released in two weeks, um, or fairly soon, um, which allows students to be able to say, this is exactly the part of the uh, paper that I contributed, and here's all the metadata and all the original data that goes back to it. So it's a tool that allows you to link that all together and will allow you, when you do cumulative theses, um, be able to much, be much more explicit about what your contribution to a multi-author paper is. But as a group leader, you should allow your students to be able to write a paper by themselves from start to finish, because if they don't, and they go off to a postdoc, and they don't know how to write a paper by themselves, they're in deep doo-doo. 
Um, this is really a fundamental skill. Um, and uh, there are lots of venues. I mean, there are, there's bioprotocols. There are lots of things that you can take relatively low-hanging fruit, parts of a thesis, and, and make that a first authored paper that they should be given an opportunity to do so. And of course, uh, so much of that is figuring out your audience and figuring out what the journal is. Um, and uh, as I said, knowing the exciting areas of the, of the scientific literature. And then also developing and understanding the, the importance of a relationship to the bread and butter journals. And New Phytologist for me is a, is a wonderful bread and butter journal in the sense that you know, it's not nature and science or e-life, but it's definitely there where the solid, defensible uh, papers and ones that are, uh, particularly cross that functional mechanistic boundary um, can be published. And for every big splash paper that you get, um, you know, there should be five or six good, bre solid bread and butter journals that f provide the foundation for that big splash paper. So the important thing about these bread and butter journals is that it prevents you from shooting too high, thinking that every paper that you publish should go into the best journals, and then having that most demoralizing process as your paper goes down that trophy cascade of journals until it finally gets ground to the point where it finally fits. And by that time, you are so sick and tired of that paper, your students are so demoralized and they never want to do science again. It's, it's really a much more satisfying process when you submit your paper once and it gets into that journal exactly where you thought it should be. And so that's really an important discussion that you need to have with your students. So getting back to those five essential skills. Um, organizational skills is the, the last thing I want to talk a little bit about. And that is um, uh, well, one I basically like to categorize um, in two basic types, as a hunter scientist versus a gatherer scientist. Hunters are the type of scientist who's willing to chase a question. And remember, it's always the question. Just like a, as if it's a rabbit going under bushes and through trees and over the hills and learning any possible technique that is necessary to chase that, that particular question. People who do forward genetics are constantly having to be hunter style things because you never know what the gene is that's going to be in your log score that, that's going to... That, you're going to have to chase down for its functional analysis. Gatherer scientists are those who like to set up like, like big deep sea fishing nets, ways of harvesting enormous amount of, of, of data, not necessarily having a particular driving question for that, but then figuring out how to pull uh, questions out of this uh, enormous amount of data. Now, it's clearly, it's a lot easier to have a nine to five approach to your science if you are a gatherer type of scientist. But in these days of big data, when there's lots of other people have gathered enormous amounts of data, it's really important to teach students how to be a hunter in other people's gathered data sets so that you can mine a question quickly before you actually get to the bench and start to uh, do experiments directly. The main thing I wanted to emphasize here is that you should not let your organizational skills, which should be beautiful, honed, and absolutely meticulous because there is no science that comes out of a disorganized person. And, and if there is, there's usually problems that come from that. But you should not uh, let your organizational skills turn you into um, a machine, because it is the passion, after all, that drives the creativity. Um, and the organizational skills should not take over that. The other thing I wanted to just mention is the issue of time. Um, uh, most young PhDs frequently bite off much more than they can chew. Um, when they, they want to ask a question that's lar too large and intractable. And the way, what's, what's um, the most challenging part is harmonizing that ambition which you want to cultivate with reality of the fact that their PhD is frequently only three years or in some places uh, a little bit longer in, in, in other Anglo-Saxon countries, maybe five years. And there are many reasons for the funding agencies making the PhD period shorter and shorter. And these are good reasons, but it's having a really bad collateral effect on the process of being a PhD and being a scientist. And that is that, that advisors are handing out pre-digested, pre-thought out projects, and PhDs are becoming more like the German technicianship, um, which is what I think a German, a German PhD frequently is because it's only three years long. You don't have enough time to make mistakes, to make it your baby. Your thesis has to be your baby, not your advisor's baby. And that bonding process takes time. A student has to be able to see their thesis question as if it was written on the inside of their glasses and they see the world through it during their PhD time. Otherwise, they won't develop that scientific grit necessary to do a good job. Okay.
So that was the, the, the five things I want to talk a little bit about. And I want a little bit to talk a little bit about, about the process of how to stay in the game for the long run. Now, Lewis Carroll, when he gave the words to the Red Queen, he described beautifully the life of a scientist. It takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. If you want to get somewhere else, you just have to run at least twice as fast. And that's the truth, right? There's no way to sit back on your laurels and after you get your PhD, you know, think you're going to stay in research. It's a, it's a process of keeping it going. And that's why this business of being a knowledge addict and really be addicted to that process of knowing what's going on is so essential. Now, um, one of the weird things about being a scientist is that it's a classic example of the Peters Principle. Once we become successful in, as, as a, an experimental scientist, that means we get promoted, and we get promoted to be a science manager rather than a science practitioner. And that means that you're going to spend less and less time doing the very things that keep you in touch with the creative source of what makes you happy as a science. It keeps your brains and your hands out of the science. And you have to make plans in the long run to how to stay abreast of your particular critical areas that actually allow you to do it so that any time you get a sabbatic, do a sabbatic that allows you to get back to the bench and get back and re reconnect to those particular things that you cut your teeth on it during your PhD and that you really knew what you were doing. For me, it's always been fixing mass spectrometers um, or doing natural history. And I think one of the wonderful things about, um, uh, so this is what I mean by scientific grit, is to hang on to that process for the long run and figure out ways of hanging on to that process of being rejuvenated with your connection to your science in the long run. And it can be microscopy, it can be almost anything, but you just have to make sure that you don't get administrated out of it and the distance doesn't get too long. After a couple of years whew, in fast moving fields, whew, you are really very quickly out of date. Um, now, I want to argue that one of the easiest ways to, to maintain this for the long run is to bring some natural history component with you because no matter where you go, there's natural history. No matter what you do in your bedtime, in your sleep, you can think about natural history and it just allows you to connect to your organism. Now, here's the problem about being a plant biologist. You want to have empathy to your organism, but it's pretty hard to be empathetic if you're studying plants. Why? Because plants are so damn different. And if you take a plant physiology course, which luckily enough I didn't do until very late in my career before I had to teach plant physiology, you get taught that plants have all these differences. They have photosynthesis, they've got millions of stomates, they've got their cells confined in boxes, they, you know, they're just not like animals, okay? And worst of all, they're growth machines. This is the why we like plants, because they can grow, they can make food. We've heard all these motivations or these talks about why we study what we do, because they make, make, you know, make food. But plants are also Darwinian organisms. They want to maximize their Darwinian fitness, just like you and me. And they want to do that by producing successful grandchildren. And taking that behaviorist approach toward plants makes it much easier for you to empathize with plants. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how I've been thinking about plants for a long time. And plants, yes, they are growth machines. And they photosynthesize, and they make carbon, and they do all these wonderful things with their ability to be anabolic and they make various things that are useful for growth, reproduction, and storage, but they also do this other wonderful thing, which they make secondary metabolites, and they make billions of them. And if you take any human in this room, and depending on what you ate for lunch, and drop yourself into a wearing blender and analyze the metabolome, you got about only 3,000 metabolites. You take your average plant, you drop that plant into the wearing blender, and you get uh, on the order of 250 to 300,000 metabolites. This chemical diversity is where the behavior lies because they use these chemistries to solve ecological problems. And if you like chemistry and you can think of chemistry as simply just another behavioral modality, you will have a much easier time empathizing with plants. And one of the cool things that's happened just in the last 10 years is that mass spectrometry following Moore's law and getting all those faster computers has been able to scan speed, have faster chroma chromatography, faster scan speeds, and you can actually capture a fairly large portion of a plant's metabolome f with an instrument that you can actually afford to buy and put into your laboratory when you start up a lab. And that's just amazing. The hard part is just dealing with the data. And there are lots of ways of dealing with that data. So you, as a young plant scientist, can fairly straightforwardly capture a large part of that behavioral repertoire of what a plant do. So 
how do you ask, how do you know what a planet's doing? How do you know what it's doing with its chemistry? And uh, what we have been doing in the group for a long time is figuring out ways of thinking like a planet and asking plants uh, questions. And to do that, we have been trying to phytomorphize ourselves. And what I mean by this term, phytomorphization, is to contrast it with anthropomorphization. And one of the easiest ways to understand what it means is to give you an example of a book which is not phytomorphization, but pure anthropomorphization, if you know this book here, The Secret Life of Plants. Um, it's just useless in terms of telling you about how plants work, because they're just attributing human attributes to plants and not trying to attribute plant attributes to humans. And that's exactly what you want to do if you want to phytomorphize yourself. So in the genomics area, how do you ask a plant a question? Well, you query it. You put it into an ecological circumstance. You get it to do something. And then you ask its sequence of events as it goes through from, from gene uh, expression to, to phenotype. And there are so many beautiful new ways that are changing every day about how to ask the transcriptome, particularly in interesting questions. There are so many new and interesting ways to ask the proteome. Um, there are so many new and ways to ask the metabolome. What there aren't very many new and ways of doing is asking the phenotype. We still are left pretty much in the, in the pretty crude ways of, of characterizing with a bit of advances from um, digital work and a little bit advances from a microbial microbiome characterization, um, we're still pretty much, you know, doing things the old way. So let me tell you a little bit about this process of how do you characterize the phenotype of plants um, uh, that we've done in our department. So we work with this, this native tobacco plant. And in 1996, um, when I set up the institute in Yana, I made the gamble that it was going to be easier to get natural history, uh, easier to bring molecular tools. Remember, there was no Arabidopsis uh, genome sequence at the time. Um, uh, transformation was still a black art. It still is a black art. Um, so I made the gamble that it was easier to bring all those tools that, that the Arabidopsis world has to a plant that has interesting ecology. Arabidopsis has limitedly interesting ecology. So spent a lot of effort developing tools for this, and it was so wonderful to hear in Beverly's talk about how, how she is uh, developing all those tools in other non-model systems. And this is really what this time is all about, the, the, total, the time of non-model systems. So um, yeah, so we work on attenuatum. Um, and Carla, thank you for, for switching times with me. I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the interesting behavior of attenuata. It chases fires. Um, is, are you Carla? No, so where's Carla here? And Carla's going to give the next talk about flammability uh, of plants. And this is a plant, attenuata, uh, makes long-lived seeds. Um, and the seeds just lie in the seed bank for upwards of 400 years. And then it responds to smoke factors. And then it pops out of the seed bank in response to those smoke factors. They're not keratins, by the way. Um, uh, they don't involve the MAX1 signaling system. Um, and they uh, germinate in nice coordinated responses. So we have this, this a wonderful ability to combine what is best done in Germany, which is meticulous reductionist science um, uh, at the Max Planck Institute in Jena. And then we have an 8,000 kilometer corridor that takes our plants um, uh, out to field stations in Utah and Arizona. Um, and uh, there is where we, uh, basically the scientific questions start and end and hit and do tests. And these are examples of our fields, the abiotic conditions um, uh, that occur out there in Utah. Um, and, uh, and for two decades, we've been doing reverse genetics, taking out plants that have particular gene silence and planting them out there. And what's so interesting is that um, a large portion of the plants that we transform genes for have no phenotype in the greenhouse at all. Um, and this is actually the reason why I was a little bit hard on Quinn's talk about redundancy. Most Arabidopsis biologists would argue, oh, gene redundancy, no phenotype. That means they all do the same thing, right? Um, well, yes, they don't have any phenotype in the greenhouse. But guess what? Plants don't evolve in greenhouses. And when we take these plants out into Utah, where they get challenged by a whole multitude of different interactors, we almost always find a phenotype. And the, we find these phenotypes not necessarily by looking at plants, because we don't, we're not really all that good at looking at plants. But all these organisms here that, that interact with Nicotiana attenuata are really good at phenotyping attenuata, because they make a living doing it. And so we have so many examples where basically you can use nature as a laboratory to study gene function, because this is where function really happens. This is what determines whether or not a gene is maintained in a genome or, or pseudogenized or not. 
And these are the organisms and the selective factors that drive that. And I can tell you many stories if I had hours to talk about how these different organisms have told us very interesting things. And of course, we don't just do ham-fisted, uh, constitutive uh, gene knockouts. We have all sorts of dex-inducible constructs now that allow us to time the, the silencing with a particular interaction or a particular plant part. We also have a number of plant-mediated RNAi constructs that allow us to put insect genes into plants. And then the insects that feed on the plants have the gene silence in the insects. And that works for quite a long time to be able to study lots of how insects attack and metabolize plants and the like. Um, uh, and, um, and then, of course, now that we've uh, sequenced the genome of the plant and finally got it assembled, it's a monster genome, um, we've been able to now start forward genetics and we have a bunch of real lines of both a, a biparent and a 26-parent one that captures pretty much most of the genomic diversity in attenuata. And that's what I'm heading out right this afternoon to go harvest um, um, a real plantation of about 14,000 uh, different rills here in our Utah plantation. This is what the, the plot looked like in the beginning uh, of of March when we first planted it. But then there's, of course, this other component, which is a phenotype that I actually haven't seen any posters of in this session. I've seen a lot of pathogenic uh, and mycorrhizal interactions, but there's all these bacteria that play wonderful um, uh, functional roles in plants. And attenuata picks up its microbiome. It's born sterile, but it picks up its microbiome in the, in the few hours after germination. And many of those consortia that it picks up, it, it has... Uh, uh, very interesting evolutionary interactions with and gets them to solve all sorts of problems. So that if you want to really understand how, an, how a plant is adapted, you shouldn't just look at the nuclear genome, you should also look at the extended genome, all the different micro, uh, the microbiome that it recruits during uh, its growth processes. So for 10 years, we basically looked at this particular interaction. Um, uh, Manduca sexta chewing away on, on a tobacco leaf, and uh, right there on the edge of the tobacco leaf, you can see a little green slimy stuff, and uh, um, we were able to identify the elicitors. These are the HAMPs, uh, very much like a PAMPs, that consist of fatty acid amino acid conjugates that that when you do, just like uh, Peter had shown in the talk before, if you take a wound response, you get a certain re uh, response in the plant. But if you add to, those, to that wound response um, these spit factors, these elicitors, you get a very complicated and beautifully orchestrated six-layer change in the plant's phenotype that allow it to deal with this particular herbivore that has broken through one of its main resistance traits, namely its nicotine resistance. And, and that signaling system has got uh, all sorts of wonderful components to it. It has a core of jasmine signaling, but it has a whole lot of other things. There's kinases that decorate the beginning part. There's a beautiful lec arcade. There's ethylene signaling. And all of this other extra stuff that's on there um, is basically to allow the plant to know it's being attacked by Manduca sexta, and Manduca sexta does not, which is the larvae there that was feeding, does not brush its mandibles before it eats a plant. So it brings in all sorts of microbes, and the microbes, of course, activate pathogenic responses. And if it did that and activated the salicylic cascade, the plant would be really compromised in its defense responses. So all of this signaling is basically to make sure the plant understands caterpillar, not pathogen, do the jasminate thing. Um, and that's what a lot of this is all about. And of course, this took an awful lot of people to do, but everyone who had identified a particular node there got a particular mechanism to manipulate that expression process and took them out into the field and learned some really interesting things about the function. And I just want to end on two stories here of two students who've just done very much the same sort of thing. Um, we've been looking so intensively of leaf feeding uh, uh, responses, uh, responses that, that are in the attack leaf and spread throughout the plant and cause the plant to do, a, do a lots of different things. And I wanted to mention a, a story of, of one student who's been looking at, at flower responses and another student who's been looking at a stem borer. Um, the stem borer, and then they're, of course, they're, they're specialists that feed on lower leaves and upper leaves and roots, and I could go on forever about, about how the plant tailors that. But uh, the first story is about Yong Song Ju, um, who is a PhD student from, uh, uh, from Korea, and his wife, Ji Suk Lee. They took on the process. They're both ecologists. They'd never done any molecular biology before. They did a beautiful job of figuring out the natural history of this particular uh, uh, weevil. Um, there's, there's actually a two-species complex in it. They live inside the stem of plants. They do absolutely no damage to the plant other than to eat the pith out of the plant, which the plant doesn't seem to have a big fitness consequence for. And it turns out that there's a completely separate jasmate signaling response that only activates defenses in the pith using some of the defenses that are in leaves but are not 
inducible or defenses in leaves. They're only defenses in the pith. And, the, and this is all a process of keeping that larvae that lives in the stem, that goes up the stem, eats out the pith, and then it turns around and comes right back down again, eating its own poop. It becomes coprophagic on the way back down and then develops into a little adult who waits nicely for the plant to break and senesce and then it flies out. And it's, it's this wonderful tolerance response where they actually worked out a, a thing where the plant do, doesn't get damaged seriously and, and the larvae is still able to, to grow. Um, so there's this wonderful separation that the plant is basically separated into different chemical niches based on the feeding and, and signaling behavior of it. There's a separate signaling cascade that activates a systemic response that involves these phenylamines. And then there's a separate one that in the pith that activates these quinic acid that includes chlorogenic acid conjugates. So basically, when it comes to the plant, it's a lot like Las Vegas. So when it comes to the pith, what happens in the pith stays in the pith and doesn't spread anywhere else. And this is how a plant can get partitioned into different sectors. The second story I wanted to tell you is going to be published in PNS uh, on Monday by, uh, by Ran Lee. And Ran Lee is a classically trained postdoc who came totally as a molecular biologist. He knew how to do protein-protein interactions. But he, too, was also driven by this passionate drive to understand how things work. Um, he's uh, married, has a, has a beautiful daughter who comes to the laboratory on a regular basis. There's no need for boyfriends or girlfriends here. Uh, they all understand the passion, um, and they're all integrated into that passionate response. And Rand, in particular, was interested in, in floral defense. And we knew very little about floral defense from our previous work. We've been knocking out uh, floral scents and, and defense compounds in, in flowers and noticing that, that when you do that, there's a bunch of moths that lay their eggs in flowers, which normally don't do. So we have these sort of these data from a previous science paper um, that describes that. And what Rand did was just take some of our knockout lines for jasmine signaling, taking the, the AOC line and the, and the koi line, took them out into the field and just looked at what the flowers were happening. And the flowers are getting clobbered um, in these jasmine signaling plants. So there was all sorts of herbivores. Um, there were um, uh, tree crickets on the right-hand side, a mirrored bug, uh, um, a helithine uh, larvae that, that showed up, and then, and then even cucumber beetles were showing up eating these flowers. So clearly, defense signaling had been abrogated when you abrogated jasmine signaling. Now, Rand did one more interesting thing. He started to look at the jasminates in those flowers, and he looked at that jasmine burst that happens after caterpillar attack and those spit factors that come into the leaf that normally give you a little jasmine burst um, of about 900 uh, nanograms per gram. Uh, and uh, he then looked at them in the flower, and you see that in stage one flowers, they have a remarkably high jasmine level. Now remember, jasmine signaling requires JA to be conjugated with JS leucine, so it then can get uh, um, recognized by the koi jazz complex, uh, which we heard nicely from Peter's uh, talk uh, previously. And you see there's something weird here. Look at the JA isoleucine levels in flowers in stage one. They're almost at 900, micro, uh, 900 nanograms per gram. That means that which is the same level as the JA level. That means that 100% of the JA is being converted to JA seleucine, which contrasts to what happens in the leaf, where only about 10% or 15% of the JA gets converted to JA seleucine. So there's clearly something different about jasmine signaling. And what Rand did was to go to look at our RNA-seq database and look at the jazzes there, and not all jazzes are alike. There's 12 of them in Attenuata's genome, and jazz I here down at the bottom is only expressed in flowers. It is not activated by the classical canonical JA, uh, uh, jazz, jazz complex there. And when you do the typical yeast to hybrid pull down uh, interaction studies, you see that the jazz I is not at all interacting with the canonical complex. It's completely circuited, self-circuited there. And he went on and then discovered a new ninja-like uh, um, protein, which actually jazz I does interact with and provides this MIG2 circuit. Uh, this, as I said, will be showing up in, in the proceedings um, on next week. And the main point here is, here you have two students coming from completely different backgrounds um, who have made major discoveries, and those major discoveries come from one simple thing, and that is spending some time in the field looking at your plant. Here's Yong Song Ju, who's also, by the way, he's the PhD student, has also discovered some really interesting things about what the clock really is doing with regard to photosynthesis. That will be coming out soon in Journal of integrated plant biology. Unfortunately, new phytologists did not like that paper. Um, <laughs> so I want to argue that, that in addition to those five essential skills that I said were important to be teaching your 
Students, there's one more skill that I think is particularly germane for plant biologists, and that's a skill that just is not being taught in our graduate programs, and you cannot count on it being taught in the undergraduate programs you come from. And it is one of those skills that might be milita militated against by the sort of social media um, gaming-oriented process that an awful lot of particularly young males uh, get addicted to uh, in their early development and hijack some of that um, knowledge addiction part. And that is this process that Yogi Berra, the, the uh, New York Yankees catcher, describes so nicely in one of his tautologies, and that's this one here, that you can observe a lot by just watching and training our students to just watch and try to figure out what's going on from the plant's perspective is one of the most important gifts that you can give to your students if they're going to be plant biologists for the long run. And really, just to harmonize a little bit on what June had said in her, um, Jane had said in her previous talk, that you know we are in a sort of a bittersweet situ situation as biologists. Um, you know, we're we're losing most of our biodiversity. You know, we hit peak baby, we got seven billion mouths to feed right now. We're gonna go to 10 billion mouths to feed in your career. And it doesn't look really good for the ability to have any natural habitats left. It would be a lot easier to come up with the political will and money to preserve those natural habitats if scientists were saying, these are our laboratories. This is where we're gonna understand gene function. And we need to use GM and manipulative tools in those laboratories to understand gene function, because without it, we can't parse correlations from causality. And I think what we've seen from Beverly's and, and, and Jane's talks is that we're really out of the end of what I call model system myopia, where we can only really be asking questions that our model systems have. Rabidopsis is a wonderful plant for, for genetics, with exactly what it was, to, it was designed to. But it just doesn't capture the incredible diversity of traits, like the mangrove trees that we heard about previously, that we are now ready to explore. And you're the generation to do it. So all the power to you. Um, yeah. I need to acknowledge a bunch of people, the Max Planck Society that, of course, funds this work. No other society would have the long-term patient funding. Um, Brigham Young University that allows me to do the field releases at their uh, nature preserve, the Lytle Ranch Preserve. And many people for some beautiful photographs I've hawked, and particularly Gunnigal Lapinda, who would love to have been here if it wasn't for Ryanair, who did a lot of uh, some of the, the work on the PowerPoints. And, oh, and I also get to thank some of the people who actually were important in, in transforming this guy who was just a, a, an automobile mechanic and logger at a time into a scientist. And that was Jack Schultz at Dartmouth College. Um, and you rarely get to thank the people who mentor you. And that's just to remind you that one of the most important impacts that you will have as a scientist is mentoring other people. And sometimes watching out for that oddball is uh, the way to, to really have an impact. Thank you for your attention.